it's just an oversight. And unfortunately, at this level and with the player's health being a concern, because it's it's hot over there. In those Southeast Asian countries, it's hot. And you're playing for 16 hours straight up to 5 in the morning. There are health concerns. And we're very lucky that nothing ended up happening, like players fainting, passing out. Could you imagine had that happened? Yeah. Could you imagine if the players had complained? We are live. We are. Episode number nine of The Siege Show presented by Jake and Guz. And it's yet again another big week of Siege. Um, probably not as much generalized talking points today as I think today might end up being a little bit more esports focused. We've had some very interesting uh, topics that have arisen, especially as of last night, as many are aware by the time this is going, going live, the whole Asia LCQ debacle, we'll get into all of that and... Um, probably have to sort of toe the line. We've got to be a little bit careful with sort of what we can, can't say, but disappointing that it kind of even happened in the first place. And I think we'll probably just sort of touch on it a little bit now, to be honest, because it is sort of on the mind and it is at the forefront of, of kind of what's happened over the last couple of days. And for those completely unaware, basically for the Asia LCQ, we ended up covering three best of threes in the upper bracket portion of the double elimination that they've got over in Asia LCQ, which is very different to what other leagues actually have. And unfortunately, all at the bottom bracket never got covered. And not only did it not get covered, the admins left completely. Yeah. Um, oh boy. Yeah, quite a debacle. Um, so heading into stage two, Asia did get a, a rework. They added the double alien bracket. But I guess there was a big oversight as to how do you then compact that into three days. Mm. There needed to have been a lot more care and thought i think put into it and yeah unfortunate the way in which it played out we literally had a, a vtuber in mandarin cast a major call game i mean that is just embarrassing so there needs to certainly be a review as to what took place not only was there the broadcast but also the admin debacle the fact that bleed for example played for about 16 hours you should yeah. be awake for 16 hours you should not be playing competitive siege for 16 hours and if there had have been like some kind of serious health concern or something as a result of that that would not have gone down well either so yeah some big concerns props of course you know to the players who had to stick it out i mean yep. far from optimal conditions and they probably could have complained a hell of a lot more than i think they did so yeah disappointing overall but as i'm sure we'll jump into maybe later it didn't probably impact the two teams that should have gone anyway thankfully but yes. it definitely could have and that would have or well, that would not have, not have gone down well <laughs> yeah and the biggest issue because i know in the morning because it was very very late in the morning we were up probably three four in the morning and all of this was on. i was up at six o'clock in the morning and the game hadn't even started yeah this was all unraveling like, of course starting. australian time is different to singapore time so all of that i think they ended up finishing though at 5 50 a.m local time for the players that is ridiculous and should never happen the, the biggest thing for me is you can't put decisions into the, the hands of the players so you can't just let it go okay in in this instance bleed and elevate we're in that lower bracket final you can't then say for each other, okay, what if we want to postpone this? Like that's power that they should not have. Because then it's like, who gets the, the favoritism from that? Who actually benefits from that? Is it is it Bleed who were able to not play any of the games for so long, then they get to strat, they get to sleep? Or is it Elevate who have all the momentum going into that final? They've been playing, but are they tired? It's, it's really difficult to sort of dissect that. And so um, you might end up having one team that's sort of like, hey, we're tired. We've just been playing three best of threes, which is what Elevate had to do versus um, Bleed, who, yes, they did play a best of three, but that was like 10 hours ago. And to then say, we're tired. Can we postpone to tomorrow? And Bleed are like, no, we're well rested. We'll play it. And, yeah. and that's and that's what we've been told. Um, from my understanding, the teams got told the games must be played and that was it. And then the admins left and the admins were just gone. And, and that is bizarre. And the fact that the map veto process was being done by a community caster in Mandarin, by the way, <laughs> uh, is just baffling as to how that has even transpired yeah. in the first place. Now, I know that um, Fresh was posting on Twitter last night as well, getting involved. You can probably chuck up a few of his tweets and yeah. um, made some really, really valid points. And we know that Fresh, and we love Fresh because he always speaks his mind and he's happy to um, let everyone be aware as to what's going on. And unfortunately, this is a situation where it's a big L. Um, I know the people who are involved and and I don't think it's malicious. It's, it's not malicious. It's just an oversight. And unfortunately at this level and with the player's health 
being a concern because it's it's hot over there in those southeast asian countries it's hot and you're playing for 16 hours straight up to five in the morning there are health concerns and they were very lucky that nothing ended up happening like players fainting passing out could you imagine had that happened could you imagine if the players had complained vigorously and we're also quite lucky that imagine if a bleed had a loss and then there's the complaints should this have happened should this not have happened is there a replay all of those things so look i think elevate will know then they're not as good as bleed. They got beaten. I think it was three one in in the grand final or two one two one two yeah. one. Well, they did win the first map, but I think uh, obviously I was asleep, so I didn't say that. Yeah, yeah. But we're... apparently Reaps absolutely popped up twenty five. Yeah, so I don't know. Reaps is obviously probably a bit of a, a sleep demon, so it was probably prime hours for him. Yeah, but yeah, I pretty much echo the. That was seven four by the way. That third map was seven four, and I looked at the scoreboard, and it was a three nothing start to elevate. So they were four rounds wow. away from going to the major and, and basically stealing it from bleed and, and the controversy that that would that have been happened, I tell you what. had that happened. <laughs> I mean, seriously, look, I'm very happy for bleed. They deserved it. Obviously fury ended up beating them. We'll get onto all of that uh, later in our power ranking segment, but we got the, the two best teams. Fortunately, despite all of the issues, despite all of the debacles, the two best teams go from Asia, but hopefully this never happens again. Hopefully there's lessons and hopefully um, this is not going to be a repeat later in the future. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to. I don't want to lose my job to a VTuber. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we got to be very careful, obviously, with what yeah, we say. I, but at the same yeah. time, this is meant to be no bullshit. We'll obviously toe the line, the the company line. We're not going to go bash people. And I, again, as I said before, I don't think anything was malicious. I don't think anyone screwed up that we usually interact with. Unfortunately, it was others, and so we're just sort of you know letting people know mistakes were made. Shit happens, but this is a big shit that happened. It's a big mistake. As long as it, as long as there are learnings from this, and it never happens again, yeah, then it's fine. Yep. Um, it's a mistake that never should have happened because we're at a elite level with a lot of money being invested into this product. But, like you said, shit happens. Yep. But do not let this happen again. Yep. All right. Let's uh, move forward with, I guess, a little bit more of the regular show and, and get through some of our segments. Most uh, importantly, what is I think one of now my my favorite segments, the debate hot top hot topic segment, where we come up with two questions or two debates and um, get your thoughts, I guess, more than mine because I'm the one presenting the the questions to you, uh, and also I guess the the viewers' thoughts if you want to get involved on yeah. this. And we've actually had a lot, especially over the last three episodes or so that I've been doing this segment. A lot of people have been engaging in the comments with it, so mm. keep going with that. We love it. We read it. We react to it, and sometimes we reply to it as well. Yeah. And um, the first one is, I don't know if it's as much a hot take as it is just a genuine question. Should Siege have six operator bands in both ranked and competitive? Mm. Okay, so this is an interesting one. And I think this is a discussion that's probably propped up more in the last, I think it probably actually started maybe like a year or two ago, starting to see tweets and stuff, especially within the pro community, as to whether or not we're now at a point where we need more operator bands because you think about how many operators there are now mm. in siege how diverse the pools are i think we're very very close to having or needing a system where more operators are banned and my mind especially in the current meta goes towards defense at the moment i feel like almost every ban phase of this stage we reiterate the same storyline which is you cannot ban out all the super power powerful operators even if you wanted to you've got like the valk the solace the azami the the solar did I say solace twice? You did say solace twice. But you've got like the big three. And if you can't, one of them is still going to be left standing if you want mm. to deal with them. So is six bands too many? Perhaps. I think it probably would be. I think one of the systems that I like and I think I saw proposed was maybe having, you have your, your attack ban and your defense ban and then potentially you have a flex ban on top of that. So you could ban an attacker or a defender mm. both teams which would then equate to six total again though that's probably still too many i fear i think that's worse so, though because i think what would end up happening is that it end up being two extra defensive bands yeah the idea behind six is it'd be now three attacker bands three defender bands mm, i think true. that's the, the way you would go about it um and the reason why i say that if you do it if you did it as a flex ban if, if both teams got a flex ban i still think they'd go defense because the vast majority of maps are still defender sided mm. so if uh, if on average they're defender sided then on average you're going to ban more defensive operators um i i think you look at like league of legends back in the day firstly when they started they didn't have any bans <laughs> and then from there they went to two bands and four bands six, uh, you know i don't even know how many they're up to now but once you get to a point where the the character pool in your game is so large 
you do need to then increase the 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 banning commodity as well. We're heading into 2024 next year, and I think it would be a good point to bring it in. I'm not talking about right now. I'm not talking about this major or this SI. I'm talking basically from next year onwards, go up to six bands and implement that into ranked because the, the operator pool is getting substantially larger. And as you said, you're now getting into a point where you're just always leaving multiple different operators on the table um, and you're always like, I can't ban them all. I remember back in the day, like when I first started casting and you think back to 20, even 2020, let alone when you started casting, you could get to a point where you could ban like the two main soft breaches or you could ban like two out of three hard breaches or whatever, like mm. um, before Ace ended up coming in. So you could kind of like do some some interesting things. Now you can't do that anymore. You can't ban out all the soft bridge. You can't ban out all the hard bridge. So there's no point doing it. So if, you, if there's no point doing it, then you end up in a position where it's like, you're just going to end up banning what are essential staples. So like your, your Yings, for example, who you can't get that from anyone else. You're going to ban your Solaces because they're, they're so impactful. Um, sometimes you might see Kaid. Kaid used to be banned a lot more, not mm. really as much anymore. Um, so... Uh, yeah, I, I think it would be fun because I think it would just shake up the meta as well a little bit. I think it would just enter a new dawn as well. Yeah. Going from four to six just gives it that little extra shake up and, and for both ranked and competitive. So my answer is yes, obviously. I, I posed the question, so I'm a yes in this You're camp. Yes, man. <laughs> I'm a yes for this. Yes to six bands for, for Siege moving okay, forward. This is, this is a really radical idea on how we could change operator bands in Siege. But imagine a league-esque system hmm. which would cut down on the ban time but would also then facilitate more bans what if ev what if both teams simultaneously <coughs> banned three operators each if you double up you double up fine fair enough but there hmm. could also be a situation where there's six unique operator bans i think that would also still introduce a decent amount of counterplay now it won't be direct because you're not responding in bans because it's not sequential but i don't know this is radical but imagine you sit there you get 10 seconds each team bans out two or three operators that you select and much like the map ban phase for instance you might double up on a on an operator or two or whatever mm. but you could also have six unique bands i mean that would be again very radical but good work maybe yeah i guess technically the biggest downside to that would be you end up in a situation where you all three are overlapped and you end up with just three bands rather than the four that you like that would have be rare now. though and that would, not only would that be rare so i think that being the rarest of cases means that it's still fine. Freezer it's fine. Life. But the only thing for me is that too confusing for the viewers. And also then from a ranked perspective, I get it kind of, but also then from comp, like it, it doesn't look as clean as if just the normal band phase where you just go through. It's definitely a crazy idea. I also admittedly. think from a logistics perspective in terms of what the current band veto system works in game, like in the actual in-game, the way it gets done, I think it'd be a lot easier to just implement, hey, here's an extra band, hey, here's an extra band, rather than that system. So going back to the original question, should Siege have six bands? Yes or no? Should Siege have six bands right now? No. I would say... Next year? I would say very monitor it very closely and be ready within two okay. years. Yeah. Okay. Within, even two is a bit of a stretch, I feel like. But Well, two years, that's what? Six, eight new well, uh, You wouldn't want to do it mid mid season like mid season or like you'd want to do it almost like okay si's finished moving forward for that calendar year and then yeah. that that sort of pro year that's i don't I think would... you want to destroy the current meadow either so no I mean, unless fine. you want to destroy okay. it so you reckon maybe two years or so but at some point it has to be done it needs to be a discussion point eventually yeah. yes. okay on to the next one which again is very controversial maybe even more so outside of siege to a lot of um external viewers and the way they view siege but mm. should guns have more recoil in rainbow six siege Okay, so I mean, a bit of context behind this answer, because probably a lot of people actually never experienced it, but when Siege first came out, the recoil system was radically different to the way it is now. When you used to shoot in the first year or two, the recoil actually didn't perfectly align. It's a bit hard to describe it without video footage, but essentially there would be like, the reticule itself would kind of like bounce around. It was a little bit weird. It, was, it felt a little bit more random, and the recoil itself is random, but... It was arguably more challenging, but I would, on the flip side, say that it was less competitive. It wasn't like CS where it was like you could spray and it would be the same. It was yeah, a bit of RNG and didn't the user feedback wasn't particularly good. So they changed it. Now the site like perfectly aligns, which has then shifted the conversation towards there perhaps not being enough recoil. We have over the years now seen things like the LMG meta get mm. nerfed by introducing insane levels of recoil. Um, so yeah, an interesting discussion point. Should guns in general, should they all see more recoil? 
maybe, but I don't know why you would want to. I guess if you want, if your aim is to try and tame the the TDM meta that we're in, it could be a good solution. But are people actually going to then be satisfied playing the game? Do we? You do people load into Siege wanting to deal with recoil? I mean, this isn't armor. This isn't fucking. Even Counter Strike has more recoil. I guess maybe if you're a Milsim fan and that's kind of what you enjoy, perhaps. But personally, I don't think we need more recoil than we've already got, do we? I don't, maybe slightly. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like again, I feel like I'm probably a contrarian on this point. I yeah. I think it's fine. I think for me, and and just because I posed the question doesn't necessarily mean I'm I'm a yes on this one. I think that when you look at Rainbow Six, the game, and all the different things that you've got to do. Mm. Um, it's not as straightforward as like a Counter-Strike. Now, obviously in Counter-Strike, you've got, say, utility that has to be used and smokes and flashes and lineups and things like that. But it's nothing to the degree of Rainbow Six Siege in terms of um, verticality and also just the, the whole wall, everything. Everything about Siege, gadgets, util. The fact that you've got to check so many different angles, it's not as simple as just holding one one particular angle and then, you know, you, you pull down. Yeah the amount of times you see people in siege that are obviously shooting and moving that it just has to remain so what do you do with that do you add a, a moving recall i don't think so i think truthfully obviously lmgs were way too strong and needed it needed that recoil on earth and that's kind of where this question comes from is like do you then do that for a bunch of other guns we're obviously in a position now where you've got a lot of fraggers how many times do we see your astros and your yanas and your nooks and and that running around and just trying to shoot people and they're you know pushing through Z and they're just able to keep moving and just have basically no recoil. Is that an issue? I'm not too sure. I, I don't think so. Because I think if you if you try to add recoil for those situations, it's going to really hinder a lot of different aspects. And I think as well, the casualness of what is Rainbow Six Siege, you think about how many people play this on console. Imagine saying to console, hey, we're going to go and add a 25% well, extra recoil. I mean, the, the counterpoint to that is that the PC and the console builds do have different recoil patterns. I don't know when they got added or if it was since day one, but there is a differential. So there is less recoil on console. I will still say that I see a lot of comments on like TikTok and stuff um, when recoil gets added to guns um, that, you know, console players do complain quite a bit and, un and understandably so. I think the, this question goes back to is gunplay the, the, four, like the first and foremost aspect of skill differentiation in Siege? I don't think it's as clear cut as like a game like CS where it definitely is. There's other elements to it. And I don't think adding more recoil necessarily is going to add a bigger skill gap in a lot of instances. I think it can be used as a tool to balance out, you know, perhaps guns or operators that are clearly too strong. Like Jaeger was, I think was a decent Like when the example. LMG's meta was a thing. An LMG when that was so prominent. So I think there could be a discussion to be had about, you know, operators like Yana, for instance, or whatever, maybe getting that, or perhaps... Okay, this is okay, this is a crazy idea, but imagine if higher magnifications or specifically the 1.5, which I know we discussed a little bit about in, in a previous episode, what if having that re that site introduced more recoil to counteract that magnification? That could be an interesting idea. Again, I, it's not realistic or whatever the fuck people are going to say about it, but it could be an interesting balancing tool. Yeah, I think that's probably one way you could look at it is adding extra recoil to certain magnifications, um, maybe the higher uh, level magnification, the higher level recoil. I think that um, overall, though, to sort of finalize the question, should guns have more recoil in Siege? I think we're both no. Like it, it, just on a, just a As blanket, a flat answer, just no. a flat, yeah, flat blanket, no there are probably things you could look into just as it was, I guess, with the LMG. And I guess with that means that Ubisoft do kind of look at it. They, they are aware of it. Like the whole recoil issue is something that they are aware of that is known to them. Um, and they will tinker with it and tweak it where they see fit. Obviously, LMGs being one. I think the, the main rifles, though, you can kind of keep them the way they are. So <clears throat> that was the debate hot topics this week. Um, maybe not as controversial as some of the the recent weeks we'll, we'll try and keep them coming though every single week and of course what your thoughts in the comments below what do you think do you think that siege should have six bands do you think that more guns should uh, well, guns in general should have more recall in siege let us know your thoughts and we move forward now to our esports segment of the show which is going to be I think week four's power rankings. I can't believe week four-ish, something like that. It's hard to four track and a half but... at this point. Where <laughs> we're at, some leagues are finished, some are not. Some are in LCQ. It's all over the place. Um, 
We'll start with NAL though, and obviously Sonics and M80 have qualified for the major. We are aware of that. And Dark Zero take down Wildcard. So despite the amazing start in the group stages for Wildcard and the dream start and the fact that it seemed as if a major berth was on the cards, they've missed out and completely have to go to LCQ now, which obviously they did beat. Uh, well, they didn't beat anyone there. Obviously, I was looking at the Space Station did beat Oxygen for the seeding. So, what do you got? Wildcard, Oxygen, Space Station. That's not an easy task. There's still some really good teams there that Wildcard have to navigate. Yeah, I mean, such a tragic story for, for Wildcard with Merck's dad passing away. So, I mean, it's it's so hard to be critical of their performance. He jumped out. I'm fairly certain Bolo of all players actually jumped in and replaced him. So that was pretty pretty interesting to see, of course. But yeah, really up upsetting and disappointing for Wildcard. Something completely outside of their control and a team that made you know a really fairy tale run throughout the the seeding portion of the league um, get struck with that unfortunate um, mm. news and those circumstances. So um, I think to still post a map against Dark Zero, given everything that happened, is still yep. a, a great performance from them. Hopefully Merc is well enough to jump back in to the roster um, and they can still have a crack at getting a, that fourth and final spot. Um, but yeah, it, it, like I said, hard to be critical of wildcard. They, I think, still put up a really good fight. Um, and yeah, as for Sonics and M80, I feel a little bit vindicated because I was championing yeah. them heading into the stage. Um, you were perhaps a little bit... I was a little more, low on M80. More conservative when it came yeah. to M80. We both got Sonics. They we, pulled through. We both did get Sonics. And they won and they win the league. So, yep. yeah, they pulled through. And that was a little bit concerning, actually. Like, I think week one, even two for Sonic was a bit A, hey, but yep. <laughs> they pulled up when it matters. And that's the, the beauty of this format <clears throat> is that, especially with the best of threes, I think more often than not, we're getting the better teams that go through. Biggest disappointment, though, has definitely been Space Station and Oxygen from NAL. I had them much higher. I had Space Station in my absolutely making it tier. Can you believe that? So, look, uh -oh. they might still be able to. They did take down Oxygen for the better seeding in the LCQ. Mm. And if I'm going to be completely honest, and, and maybe it's just because I did have them in that particular tier, I, I probably still have them good enough to get past Wildcard and Oxygen. I know that Wildcard beat them in the quarterfinals, which I believe was with Mercs, but... I think I, I feel like Space Station, that win against Oxygen just gives them probably some belief to, to get the job done. Either way, um, once again, NAL is looking quite good as we head over to EUL. Uh, and again, more vindication for you in terms of Virtus Pro. We've got them in the S tier here as they uh, <laughs> they take down Team BDS, who quite honestly seemed like they were on an Unbeatable. absolute tear. Yeah. The old BDS was back. They were just stomping everyone. They took down Eminem. Uh, and then Virtus Pro managed to get the 2 1 win in the upper bracket final. Of course, both go to the major regardless. Uh, and then in third place, Wolves do find victory as well. That one over Eminem. So back to back losses for Eminem has seen them drop a little bit in terms of our power rankings down to the B tier. I think there's a, a real solidified top four, though, in the EUL right now Virtus Pro, BDS, Wolves, and Eminem. I'd be probably. Actually, I'd be majorly shocked if Eminem miss out on the major in that LCQ. I know there's still some really top teams there, most notably Wild, G2, if they can get their shit together. But yeah. I think Eminem go into, into the LCQ as the clear favorites from EUL. Yeah, I mean, we just don't really know what to expect from G2, though. Um, I think they could probably turn it up. Um, it's interesting, though, right? We've got, like, Group A, which is completely stacked and really showed up. Group B, just dog shit. Like, com comparatively, Wild and Into the Breach, two and three in that group, and now they they played off in that fifth seed match, and it was a 2-0. Like, that's just insane to think about. Now, I know, obviously, the group stage is pretty f compact, so it's hard to get a read. But, yeah, EU shape up to be quite intriguing. Again, I feel vindicated. VP, mm. impressive. And they also took down BDS, which I certainly did not expect 2-1. I don't think we had the Wolves that high. I can't recall. Well... I can't remember. I think they probably would have been... I th if I had to go back and guess, I would have probably put them in the table. I would have yeah, assumed because the they made a pretty yeah, might good make run it. like they did last stage. But yeah. We will be doing a recap of our uh, initial major when predictions. When, when everything yeah. is done, we uh, have a lot of LCQ still to sort of finalize. And, and once really we have every single team that has qualified for the major, of course, on that particular episode, then we'll kind of do a bit of a recap and see how we fared maybe even sort of we'll get a little point system i think maybe. <laughs> i think i'm winning i think you're winning I, so I'm <laughs> yeah, still, we'll do that. <laughs> I, I think that's pretty fair I've, I've organized that one maybe last second either way <laughs> on to brazil um which again has just sort of been a region that's been up in the air and phase clan have gone from basically f tier f for phase up into a tier a for awesome because they've taken out the league they've taken down w7m yeah. from seemingly nowhere guys because they looked awful in the group stage 
Yeah, I mean, they finished third in their group. Four points. They got beaten out one by win. Five Dragons and Nip and got one regulation win. Like, it was a bit of a disaster, but they're the best of three beasts. So they get rewarded by the format. They kick things off by knocking out E1, who were, were very good. in S tier for multiple weeks for us because yep. they really came out in that group stage and played incredibly well. They got knocked down to the fifth place match and lost that as well. They didn't win a map in the bracket. So E1 go from hero to zero, whereas FaZe do the inverse. So, yeah, really intriguing. Crazy. Um, Nip as well get their spot. So now the door's kind of open for probably Liquid to slip in and get that fourth and, and final spot as would kind of be expected in this league. But I don't know. I think there's other teams that could still be st scary. Key did, did a decent job um, after taking down Black Dragons in, in the quarters. So yeah, Brazil is shaping up to be a funny old league as always, but ultra competitive. I was kind of high on NIP actually in my major predictions to see them qualify is vindication for me so i'm very happy with that i think coming into this particular stage i think everyone would have had eyes on phase w7m and liquid that fourth slot was sort of like who's going to get that fourth slot i felt like nip would to see them get it technically as third is uh, is really good for them so all eyes on liquid being completely honest all eyes on liquid to see how they go in the lcq if they miss out on the major it, that'll be a, a devastation for them as a team as an org considering the opponents that they've got remaining black dragons e1 they should be getting through there. As good as a group stage as those two respective teams had, clearly, when it came to the best of three format, they both struggled quite a bit. Over to what will be the Asia League now, Guz, and a, an Asia League that has got a lot of controversial topics. We started <laughs> the show, of course, talking about it. We'll focus on the games, and for what was apparently... Well, I say apparently. I mean, we were there. A 17-hour play day. From start of the first match to conclusion of the final match, 17 fucking hours. That is insane. <laughs> That's a record. That's got to be a record. And there were a couple of records broken. Reefs went 25 and 4. At one point, Turster went 18 and 0 across two maps. Across two maps. Yep. He had 14 and 0 on one map, and this was in an upper bracket final match. <laughs> I mean, seriously, Asia had it all. We'll and they lost. <laughs> <coughs> and they did lose that. Yeah. Um, We'll quickly start it off with the fact that once again, South Asia did not turn up as expected. Yep. Um, at no point did we overhype them. I think we were always wanting to be quite fair with the likes of Shaheens, Hasib, and Monkey Hunters that yes, they performed very admirably in South Asia. Yes, they were clearly a cut above and we did kind of put them on the same level as maybe like a Diwals, but once again, as it came to it, and once they actually had to play against these Southeast, Southeast Asian teams, they got absolutely stomped, destroyed. It was never even close. None of the matches were close. They couldn't even get a map, I don't believe, no. against any of them. And once again, South Asia proves that as a region, it's just nowhere near even Southeast Asia, and that's a concern because then who... It, it has to be considered then the worst region that has a pro league. Yeah. And it's not even close. Yeah. So, I mean, how do you remedy that? I don't know. I think there's probably going to be a lot of fair arguments made that South Asia needs to be better integrated into seas directly. Like I sort of said a couple of episodes ago, I think. Um, yeah. It, it, I don't even know where to begin. That's probably a whole other discussion yeah. for another day. But yeah, clear that South Asia are behind the eight ball. Um, yeah. In terms of how the rest of the bracket played out, um, we casted the upper bracket final. So one of the qual games, Bleed Fury 2-1. I was very confident going into that. Bleed are going to run home with this. This should be a pretty clinical, easy... Not easy, but it should be a confident performance from them. Anything yeah. but. The moment Bleed started to feel pressure in that game, they started to play scared. It was very obvious and very contrarian to what we had seen from them, especially against weaker teams where they run around and do whatever they want. The second they started to feel that heat, you could see they played like a different Bleed. Yeah. And um, unfortunately, that uh, then meant they were in that lower bracket final. They had to sit there and wait for... How long do we reckon? So... About 9.30 our time. Is that when it finished? No. I think it finished at about 11 our time yeah. or something like that. They would have had to sit there for so about six hours. Five, six hours. Yeah, six, oh seven my, hours. Oh, so. my God. Yeah. But, yeah, apparently that, I, again, asleep, didn't watch it, but apparently that Bleed Elevate game, quite competitive. Reaps popped off, goes to a 2-1. Bleed actually are able to consolidate their position after losing the first map. So that was good yeah. resilience from them. And finally, they will go to... A major. <laughs> yeah, very quickly. That Yeah, so Fury won the upper bracket final. 7-2 was the first map of Consulate. And then 7-0 on Nighthaven Labs. And they were not the respective map picks. The 7-2 on Consulate. Consulate was picked by Bleed. The 7-0 from Bleed to Fury was a map picked by Fury, which... I think at any time a team goes to Nighthaven Labs, they've surely been workshopping it. If you want to bring that out, it's the newest map in the map pool. It's a map that really teams have not wanted 
to, to really go to. For Fury to bring that out in an upper bracket final and to just get absolutely stomped on it, either they've misjudged how good they're actually on it yeah. or Bleed themselves have also been preparing for it and to sort of lay that as a surprise. Uh, and then obviously the the last map, the Chalet map, was, was pretty good, but Fury once again got on top and that were by far and away the better team. And I think we can confidently, as per the tier list, label them the best team coming out of Southeast Asia. And I'll, I think a lot of viewers... And a lot of fans will probably still say Bleed have the best chance at the major. And I think that comes down to the personnel that they've got. You think about Reaps, you think about Thursday, you think about the experience of like a mentalist. But I think as a core five, Fury are the best team from Southeast Asia. My issue is, have they got the firepower to deal with these teams internationally? Crit J was sensational. Mm -hmm. Dark, once again, I think went to another level this stage. So they're going to need those guys to perform at the major if they're going to find success. And yeah, that bleed elevate, it was 8-7. Elevate winning the first map on Cafe, then 7-5, seven, 7-4 seven, um, for what would have been a very long day for both of those two teams. Absolutely um, commendable job to, to both of those. The other thing that disappointed me is the fact that the elevate no cap game, which as we know, is a little bit of a, you know, a spicy one considering <laughs> no cap, former elevate, um, elevate, current elevate. No cap win, won the first one 7 3, and then it was 7 3, 7 4, Oregon Cafe in favor of elevate. That should be streamed. It's a shame it wasn't. Um, that would have been a really, really good game leading into the, the lower bracket. And both of those 2 1 into 2 1, I think it would have been a really, really good show, really good stream to put on. Unfortunately, we could not. So either way, Asia concluded. It's uh, finished. Asia is done. We've got our two teams. It is Fury. It is Bleed. They're the best two teams that could go, technically representing APAC South, uh, the old days. So we'll see how they go at Atlanta. Uh, have we got any more regions? Because obviously a couple other regions either haven't played or have concluded. Uh, I believe Men has already concluded because we've got GK going. Hmm. Korea did not play. We actually are covering some Korea tomorrow night. Um, the uh, Japan Grand Final, we could briefly touch on that. And Japan yep. uh, being organized by X Moment actually does have a slightly varied format because they kind of do their own thing. Their Grand Final was a best of five, mm. but it was still only three maps because Scars absolutely was a speed wiped run. the floor on Cyclops. Um, yeah, I saw some of the messages from, from James who casted it and yeah, it just seemed like it was a bit of a stomp overall. Scars have been very strong. They did pretty well at Copenhagen. And honestly, of all the APAC teams, they're probably the only ones I see actually doing anything. Well, they'll get overseas. to start in phase two exactly. this time around. So. I think they'll get to the stage. I think they might even be able to sneak a game depending on who they end up playing against. They seem to be on a roll. And it's not every day of the week you see a stomp in Japan. Typically, it's actually very close domestically. So that yep. is a big performance. My issue is going to be attack. I have no, <laughs> no issue in Scar's defense. I think if they go to your staple defensive maps, your clubhouses, your Oregons, um, cafes even, I think they'll be more than fine against these international teams. I just, I fear that they've not got the ability to attack as well as EU, NA, and Brazil. That's going to be something to keep an eye on for Japan. Yeah, they're in the S tier by themselves. No one even in the A tier. Um, Cyclops and Crest, probably not too far of each other. And I think the reason for that is Cyclops not getting a single map in the grand final. Quite yeah. disappointing. And, and it's not as if there was nothing on the line. Yes, they've already qualified for the major prize money. Straight into phase two. These are big, big benefits that you want. So they needed to try. Uh, and obviously Crest um, get the plaudits because they took down North Eption yeah. in the seeding phase match. So I think they now go into the LCQ looking as uh, one of the favorites for that final spot from Japan. It's between them and North Eption. I think we'll most likely get a rematch and we'll see whether or not North Eption can get uh, a bit of redemption there. Uh, and obviously Oceania has not concluded. Still two more player days as of this episode. And as of this episode going out... I'm pretty sure the final play day would be as of this episode's release day. Uh, and that final play day is going to have a bang game. So if you're watching this, make sure you tune into the final day of the Oceania League, which should be as of this episode's release day tonight, technically. Um, and I believe we've got Bliss and Triple R that will be going head to head and fingers crossed, depending on what happens tonight, guys, but that should be the match that determines who goes to the major from Oceania. So uh, we'll leave that all there in terms of power rankings and sort of a recap of the week. Uh, we've already pretty much ran over time more than I anticipated because we did get... <laughs> well, you had your little rant at the start. Yeah, the so. rant at the start. <laughs> so very quickly, I do want to go into one of our Patreon Q&As. Shout out to Champeros, who's um, come up with this question and we've, we haven't been ducking it we haven't been avoiding it but we just, <laughs> just keep yeah. we, we keep screwing up with time sorry champ 
Um, so he wants us to, to discuss the different formats and regions, and it's probably a good time to, to touch on it because yep. clearly we've seen Japan with a best of five grand final, Asia with a double elimination. We've got Oceania that plays just seven best of ones and that's it. Um, and then obviously you've got the more standardized formats over towards like NA, EUL, Brazil. Uh, and then you've got Mena that also do somewhat similar to Oceania. It's a mess. It's all over the place. Do you try and find a way to standardize everything or despite what seems like a bit of a mess, are you okay with some regions having some differentiating factors? Yeah, so again, offering context, and I don't think I'm revealing any state secrets by saying this because it's evident with the prize pools, but re different regions are weighted differently, right? It's not like NA and OST are both getting the same level of investment or involvement or yep. whatever. That's why they probably get a more extended format because of more broadcast days, etc. cetera. Um, <laughs> got one of the Mondays of wandering around. Um, so, I mean, the question is, in an ideal world, could every region have the exact same format where you're playing seeding games, you're yeah. having a bracket, a best of five grand final? Probably, yeah. But that's not the real world. That's not how this is going to operate. That's not going to be a viable solution. So we need to find a middle ground. There, I think every region, at minimum, should have playoffs. I think it is ridiculous yeah, that I teams agree. are qualifying for a major off best of ones. That is a very, very big oversight and I think can be alleviated with even just one or two broadcast days, which is not a huge amount more of money, if that's the concern. Um, I mean, the, the wider discussion then is, are some of the formats even being used by the Premier Leagues, like NA and EU, are even those great? I, I'm continuing to see complaints that those aren't amazing either. So yeah, it, it's interesting. Um, I don't think every region needs to have the exact same format, and I don't think it's realistic for every region to have the, the, the exact same format because it's just not viable. But I think efforts need to be made to probably standardize them a little bit more and ensure that playoffs are at least a minimum. Yeah, and I think there's the other factor as well where some leagues end up playing like this almost regular season. And I'll use Southeast Asia, South Asia as an example, where there's zero prize money. Yeah. It's quite literally just a seeding phase going into them. What is the LCQ? So you look at like obviously NAL, EUL, Oceania, they all get money for what is their regular seasons, but then you look at Asia and it's like they get nothing unless they make LCQ, make LCQ, then perform that. That's when they get some money as well. So I, I, I personally think you don't have to have every single region having the exact identical format, but I, as I agree with you, I think they've all got to have a playoff and I think the regular seasons need to matter more. I, I hate nothing more than South Asia and Southeast Asia where you end up in a situation where you're casting what is essentially seeding matches for the, the the main regular portion. We're going through weeks of work, which don't get me wrong, I love the, the fucking <laughs> yeah. work, but the games just don't matter. And then, and then what that ends up doing is it just ends up being bloat to the to the month of siege that we've got. And a lot of the games don't end up mattering. So then people are like, yeah, why um, am I tuning in? That's the thing, right? We've got this problem where it's oversaturated with games that don't matter. You've yep. got too many games in too short of a time frame that don't have enough stakes. Yep. So we need to pick that apart and on work the contrary, out how to make games mean more without the bloke. Yeah, on the contrary, you look at Oceania and all the games matter. But it's gone to the Theoretically, other Theoretically, but, but it's though. to the other extreme. Yeah. They almost matter too much because there's no secondary chances. And for the broadcast and for us, it's great because we don't have to make up bullshit. Yep. But for the players, it sucks. I think realistically, uh, to, to pretty much finalize this, I think you're always going to do better when you've got a regular season. Let's say you've got eight teams because obviously I think the majority of leagues have like eight teams in their regular portion. Top four, make a gauntlet Keep slash it playoffs. Simple. Bottom four, don't make it. Now, now, again, the permutation to this, and I know we're extending this conversation probably more than we should be, but it's because of the open format. So you need to then yep. find a way to seed in open teams. That, I think that's still solvable. You can still seed in the two additional teams through well, some little LCQ. If you have it, so like bottom four go to LCQ and they get either no prize money or very reduced. <clears throat> Top four, go to a basically little playoff gauntlet bracket or whatever. Say that if you finish first, you're at the end of it. The old gauntlet from the Oceania days was a perfect example of that. And then the other three end up, you know, sort of fighting and whatnot. Uh, and they get a bit of prize money. And then the winner of that grand final goes to the major. And guess what? If you lose from that gauntlet, you go down to LCQ and then you just do LCQ anyway. What that does is it puts, firstly, preference on finishing top four versus bottom four. So suddenly there's something at stake in the regular season. There's also the money factor. Then there's also the seeding that you get in the gauntlet. So across the whole way up the standings, you've got a benefit for doing better and better and better. Makes the games more important, more important, while still having that open format for an LCQ 
And then the LCQ, obviously, if you finish high, you get better seating. And that should be... There should be no LCQ seating matches. Get the fucking LCQ seating matches out of the way. Fuck them off completely. I hate them. They're stupid. Never do them. If you have a proper regular season, you do not need them. If you've done the regular season properly, you don't need LCQ seating matches. Mm -hmm. It's as simple as that. So that's the way I look at it. That's the way I'd like to see things move forward. Uh, and hopefully... Next year onwards, we can get a, a revamped look at sort of the way that the formats are done. But to answer the actual question, I mean, uh, to be fair, it's mainly Champion Ross is just looking for a discussion around it. We've done that. It's okay if some regions differ slightly, but I think it should be somewhat standardized. Thank you to Champion Ross for that Patreon Q&A. We've got a bunch of them um, from our wonderful, wonderful patrons uh, over on Discord as well. You too can join in on the conversation. Um, where a lot of them are actually almost match day viewers now as well in there. Yeah, we've got the chats so, going. It's um, if you want to join the conversation with everyone on Patreon, on the Discord, make sure you subscribe. We thank you so much. Of course, we answer questions. We chat with you all on the Discord as well. So if you want to interact with us, if you want to ask us questions, and if you just want to interact with our community that is slowly building and has been absolutely amazing, get on board. Uh, we'd love to have you. Of course, you get access to the exclusive content as well, which we're about to go even further in depth into some spicy discussions, along with also what will be our casting experience so far for stage two and what our thoughts, our real thoughts uh, have been on this stage. That'll wrap up episode nine. Next week will be episode 10. Oof. We'll have to get some balloons out or something <laughs> to the fact that we made it this far, guys. But uh, once again, thank you so much to everyone for watching. Make sure you hit subscribe. We're still running that giveaway as well on the Twitter, on my Twitter. Um, make sure you go and check all of that out and uh, get yourself involved. That should be ending in about three, four days. It should be ending actually just about a day after this goes live. So um, make sure you quickly get on that. If you have not, hit the subscribe button and hopefully we'll see you in the next episode. Bye-bye. Peace.